For most people, the word stroke is scary, maybe even a little mysterious. It's a condition that lives up to its name, striking patients hard and changing their lives forever. But strokes can be prevented, and many Franciscan Health patients who've had carotid artery surgery or a carotid stent placed can attest to that. Cardiothoracic and vascular surgeon Dr. Michael Tuchek will talk to me today about how surgical advances can target where the risk of stroke may dwell, mainly in the carotid arteries. He'll also explain what a TIA or mini stroke is and why it's important to pay attention to the symptoms. This is the Franciscan Health Doc Pod. I'm Scott Webb. Doctor, it's so great to have you back on. We spoke recently about triple A, and today we're going to talk about strokes, signs, symptoms, treatment options, and so on. So let's just start here, a little baseline. What is a stroke? Are there different kinds of strokes? And generally, what causes them? Stroke's a big issue. It's a brain injury caused by an interruption of oxygen-rich blood to any part of the brain. So without the blood, the brain cells die within about four minutes. So quickly detecting it and fixing it once it happens is critically important. There's two kinds of major strokes. There's ischemic strokes and there's hemorrhagic strokes. In other words, clot strokes, lack of blood supply strokes, and bleeding strokes. Let's talk about the first one. Ischemic, uh, the blood supply is cut off because of some plaque or clot is by far the most common type. Probably 80 or 85 percent of all strokes are related to ischemic strokes. And it's caused by that blockage of an artery. It either narrows down to you know 100 percent blocked or a clot or a plaque breaks off and lodges upstream in the brain blocking the blood from getting to brain cells beyond that blocked area. Clot usually comes from places like the heart when you have atrial fibrillation, irregular heart rhythms. But plaque is usually just chunks of calcium and cholesterol. Frequently it comes in the carotid arteries in the neck and when it breaks off it can go up to the brain and cause stroke. Some of those plaques are rock hard full of calcium and some of them are soft and ulcerated sort of like a pothole on 8094 here in northwest Indiana. Trucks are running over potholes all the time yeah. and small chunks of that asphalt break off making the pothole bigger over time and pieces are breaking off falling down the road. In the carotid artery, when that happens, those chunks that break off go right up to the brain, causing the damage, causing the stroke. The other kind of stroke is hemorrhagic stroke, about 15, 20 percent of the time. And that's caused by bleeding in the brain, like a ruptured brain aneurysm. People have heard of brain aneurysms. Mm -hmm. The blood then leaks out, compresses the brain inside the skull, which is rock hard, doesn't allow any expansion, so swelling takes place, and the bleeding just crushes the brain tissue, and that's the other kind of stroke. Yeah, and you talk there about the plaque, and you know I've been taking Crestor for a very long time, and I'm assuming that the reason I'm taking it, right, is to prevent, hopefully, the plaque from building in my arteries and hopefully prevent a stroke at some point. But maybe you could talk a little bit about that, you know, that plaque, like, what causes it? Where does it come from? Is, are there things that we can do, like taking pills like Crestor? Well, I take one, so I hope it works, and I have for a long time. I'm yeah, trying so to prevent too. it, yeah. probably because my diet's not so hot. But the causes of plaque are two things. There's atherosclerosis. That's just cholesterol buildup in the artery anywhere in your body. And then there's arterial sclerosis, which is the actual hardening of the artery with calcium-filled plaque. Those are the hard ones. So the soft ones and the hard ones. Most people have both. Some are more dangerous than others, depending on where they're at. If they're in your carotid artery they cause stroke. If they're in your coronary artery, your heart arteries, it causes a heart attack. If it's in your leg, you can get leg pains when you walk. So there's a host of risk factors for excessive plaque buildup, unfortunately for you and I. Yeah. Getting older, we can't change that. Smoking, a big one. Diabetes, high cholesterol, obviously, high blood pressure. Being obese or having a sedentary lifestyle. Even family history, right? You can't pick your parents. You're stuck with those genes. So you could be one of those people that forms plaque even out of good cholesterol, thanks to those bad genes. So there's a lot of reasons for it. Yeah, I've heard of the uber healthy marathon runners, you know, who have a high percentage blockage simply because we can't, in this case, you know, literally and figuratively, we can't outrun our family history. We can't <laughs> outrun the genetics, right? Right, you can't. No, no, it'll catch you every time. Absolutely. And you mentioned, as we got rolling here, how prevalent stroke is. I'd like to have you talk about that a little bit. How prevalent is it? Why is it such a big problem? Because I've been talking to some experts that 
it's happening more and more to even younger folks, people in their 30s and 40s, ages we didn't used to associate with stroke because, as you were saying, it's usually older folks like us get into our 50s and then you're at higher risk. Well, let's put it in perspective. Despite, like you just said, all the statins that you and I are taking yeah. and aspirin and earlier detection and better stroke treatments, every 40 seconds someone has a stroke. And that's about 800,000 people a year just here in the United States. Someone dies from a stroke every three minutes, making it the fifth leading cause of death in the country. That's 155,000 deaths in the United States per year. That translates out to seven million people worldwide are dying of stroke each and every year. And when you put it into real perspective, think about COVID deaths. There were about seven million to date. So in the last three years, seven million people have died of COVID worldwide. We have that many people dying from stroke every single year year in and year out. So it's a big problem. Now there are a couple of kinds of strokes. The non-lethal kind is the number one leading cause of all disabilities. So people who can't speak, who end up paralyzed because of a stroke. $65 billion and counting spent last year treating stroke victims when they can't speak, the victim can no longer drive a car, they can't work, they can't even feed themselves. The disability from stroke is catastrophic, both for the stroke victim, obviously, but also for the family. They just don't know how to take care of them. Their lost wages, there's medical expenses for the rest of their lives. It's absolutely devastating for everyone. Yeah, it is, and I think it's a good time to talk about what actually happens when we're having a stroke. And I just have a brief reference that my father-in-law, we believe, had a stroke because he was unable to use his right arm at some point. He didn't remember having a stroke. He didn't really know or associate the signs and symptoms that he was having with stroke, but the net result was he wasn't able to use his right arm after he had this event, let's say. So I'd like to have you talk about that. Signs, symptoms, what to be on the lookout for. Sure. So when a piece of plaque breaks off, for example, or a clot goes into the brain artery, you can experience a whole lot of symptoms just like your father-in-law. In his case, he had a stroke that affected just the movement in his arm. Yeah. Some small strokes are temporary, called transient ischemic attacks. They call them mini strokes. They may last a few minutes or a few hours, and then they completely go away. And so people say, oh, it's a mini stroke. It's not the real thing. Hmm. Maybe it was a small clot that got lodged in the brain. And your body dissolved it. Thank goodness. Symptoms resolve. This is a big warning sign of things to come because you know if it could happen once, thank goodness it goes away, it could happen again. So if you have a mini stroke, even if it's a temporary one, go to your doctor, go to the ER and get it checked out. But the bigger strokes that can be permanent, like your father-in-law may have gone through, yeah. even life-threatening strokes, depending on the size of the stroke, it could be in a bad place and it could kill you. Or it could be in a place where you lose your vision or you get paralyzed like your father-in-law. And it only takes four minutes. So even though it's a mini stroke, you need to treat it like it's going to be a major stroke and get into the hospital to take care of it. That's why there's a mnemonic that everyone needs to follow to help people identify is someone having a stroke. It's called B-FAST, B-E-F-A-S-T. Yep. The B stands for balance. You're walking like you're drunk and yet you're totally sober. Why am I drifting off to one side? The E stands for eyes. You have temporary blindness or blurred vision in one eye, usually not both, one eye. F for facial weakness. You get a droopy eyelid or droopy tongue or you have a crooked smile. So we always tell people smile and you see that it's crooked. The A stands for arm weakness. It could be leg weakness on one side usually. You can have speech problems. The S is for speech problems. It's slurred. They can't find words. And they were talking normally 10 minutes ago. And T, it's time to call 911. Remember, you've got that four minutes. So if you have any of those, just call 911. Don't drive yourself. Get to the emergency room and get checked out. Yeah, that's great advice for all of us, for loved ones, because I was going to ask you, what do we do if it's us or someone else? But yeah, best advice, call 911. Put your life, your brain in this case, because time is brain. You know, Put your brain in the hands of experts who can call ahead for you, make sure that the right folks are waiting for you when you get to the ED and all of that. And it makes me wonder, Doc, you mentioned mini strokes or the TIAs. Is that really like a warning? Like if you have a quote unquote mini stroke, are you going to have a major stroke most likely at some point? Well, as you said, TAs are transient ischemic attacks and it could be the clot kind, it could be the plaque kind. Hemorrhagic strokes tend to be, the bleeding ones tend to be more permanent, but those mini ones, they're temporary, they block off the blood supply and hopefully it opens up again. 
So they're warning signs, but you don't know if the stroke symptoms are going to wear off or not. Hmm. So you need to jump on these just like a permanent stroke, the non-transient strokes. Call 911, get to the hospital. Don't wait hoping the symptoms are going to go away. And even if they do go away in just a few minutes, get to the hospital anyway because right. you can't ignore it. A lot of people do. They say, oh, right. it went away, it and passed. they go back to bed. Yeah, It passed. And that's not smart because, again, somebody's knocking at your door, and it's not a pleasant invite. So remember that pothole. You know, if you really have a small pebble that breaks off, it causes that TIA, that mini stroke. It was really small. But the next pebble that breaks off could be a really big one. So if you have a TIA, it could be a sign of bigger stroke. So just get to the hospital so that big pothole doesn't become even bigger at the expense of your brain cells. Yeah, that reference you made earlier to 8094, I live in the same rough area that you do, and so I'm familiar with that. And, you know, sometimes there are little fender benders, but usually on 8094, it's a big one. It's and, a big one. Yeah. yeah, and it's a big mess. And so if we can avoid that, the better. So in the case of the driving, you listen to the traffic and you try to avoid that. In the case of this, when we're talking about, you know, blockages and strokes and so on, it seems like the best plan of action would be to try to, you know, not get there, not find ourselves having a mini stroke or TIA or the big one, if you will. So what can we do to prevent strokes? Knowing our family history, I'm sure, is one of them. But what else can we do before they do the damage? Well, in fact, you've got to be able to, you know, detect them. So the best way to prevent them is to modify your risk factors, the, the obvious things, right? Stop smoking, control your sugars, your cholesterol and whatnot, take statins like you and I are doing. But you can detect them once you have a blockage. So let's figure out how to find them. So the simplest test is for your doctor to listen. He can just put a stethoscope to your carotid artery and they're gonna hear a brewery. And a brewery is just a turbulent rush of blood like a murmur in the heart. It's like you take a garden hose, it's wide open, the water's coming out, and it's very quiet, it's trickling out, but you put your thumb over it mm. and the water flies out much faster, it's much noisier. That's a murmur, that's brewery, that's making a sound and you can hear that in the carotid artery. The faster the squirting of water pointing down at the dirt, right? It's gonna throw that dirt away, kind of like that pothole problem. So the faster it's going, the more the increased velocity, the speed that the blood is going through that narrowing, we can detect that with a simple Doppler. And that dirt flying out of the way, of course, is just like a blockage. Your thumb is blocking things off. And that's the chunks of plaque that then break off because they have higher velocity. So of course, the faster the trucks are going, the more easily the things break off of the pothole. And you can hear that. So your doctor should listen. That's the first thing. You may not be able to hear it in everyone. So we have real simple carotid Dopplers, like the ultrasound test you do on a pregnant woman to look at the baby in the abdomen. Uh, except we do the same thing on the carotid arteries in the neck. So we can see the velocity change, like the water in the hose. You can see the actual plaque. You can measure the narrowing. And when it gets to be about 60 to 70% blocked, we start to take it very seriously. We'll suggest perhaps an angiogram, a catheter in the groin. But the most common test is a CAT scan. Very simple. We can see all the details. It's like the high def plasma screen TV. Ultrasound's like a black and white TV, but the CAT scan really tells us everything. And we can see what the plaque looks like. Is it smooth? Is it calcified? Is it soft? Is it ulcerated like that pothole we were talking about on 8094? By the way, I-65 is pretty bad also. But the more trucks that hit it, right, the more pieces easily break off. And in the carotid artery, that means stroke or TIA. Yeah. And we can see that on CAT scan non-invasively. So that's the best test for it after those. Yeah, and then are we talking about their surgical and non-surgical options? And once you detect a blockage, is it you start with medications and then move on if you have to? Right. So the good news is stroke's preventable. We're trying to prevent it by taking statins and trying to improve our health. But for stroke specifically, checking your blood pressure with a portable cuff. I tell all my patients, go to the drugstore and just check your blood pressure several times a day. It could decrease your risk of a hemorrhagic stroke from high blood pressure. So watching your blood pressure is really important. Check for an irregular heart rhythm. Just take your pulse. If you, My Apple iWatch does it. I can mm -hmm. just check my pulse. I've got AFib. Get to the doctor. They can put you on blood thinners or get you out of AFib. That can alert you to see, you know, you need to see your physician about these problems and take medications to prevent it, for example. The, getting tests like carotid Dopplers, which are easy, echocardiograms or CAT scans, they're all non-invasive tests. They're easy, they're painless, and they can detect sources of potential stroke in the heart, in the carotid arteries, in the brain itself. And then we can target those areas with 
stents or minimally invasive surgery to clean out the plaques that cause strokes. You can cure them before they do harm. Of course, yeah. you need to modify your risk factors like cholesterol and whatnot. That's the most important thing to do. But if the plaque's there and you're stuck with it, you've already got it, like I probably already do, <laughs> then if we think it's significant based on these tests, we can address it directly to prevent stroke from ever happening. So the first way, the simplest way, is a stent. We hear about stents in the heart. We can push the plaque out of the way with a stent. It's less invasive. You have to use cerebral protection because when you open up that plaque, pieces can break off. So they put an umbrella up there, like a fine screen umbrella, to catch the little pieces, the debris that comes off. Stents do great work short term, but the artery is still smaller than what you started with, what you were born with. So the recurrence rate, it could come back, is a little bit higher. Only time will tell. The most tried and true way is to remove it completely and patch the artery. It's called a carotid endarterectomy. We do it through a two or three small inch incision in the hole. You're asleep, we open up the artery, scrape out the junk, all those quarter pounders with cheese and hamburgers and pizza that we've been eating all our life, and then we just <laughs> patch it to make it bigger. Yeah. So bigger than what you were born with, so it's much harder for the plaque to build up and narrow in the artery sure. in the future. That's the gold standard currently to prevent carotid plaques from causing strokes, both short-term and long-term. Again, it takes an hour and 15 minutes, you're home the next day, the risks are very low, it prevents devastating strokes, both stents and surgery. So there's non-invasive, zero risk testing, like yep. a simple carotid Doppler, and if need be, some low-risk procedure to prevent stroke. Between the two, you can beat stroke before it beats you. I love it. That should be on a T-shirt or something. That, uh, <laughs> yeah, Fran I wish. I should. Let Francis can know. You know, just as we wrap up here, reiterate again for listeners the general risk factors. I know it's the same for stroke and heart attack. Time is brain. Time is heart. Remind us again, doctor. So essentially the general risk factors for stroke are the same as heart attack. Smoking, diabetes, family histories. You're, again, you're stuck with those bad genes. High cholesterol, high blood pressure, elderly being older sedentary lifestyle, obesity, they all increase your risk for both heart attacks and strokes. You can't get younger, you can't change your genes that you know, your parents gave you, but you can fix most of these. You can stop smoking, you can keep your diabetes under control. By far, of all those, high blood pressure is probably the worst risk factor, I think. So go to the drugstore, buy a portable automatic cuff, take your blood pressure, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and bedtime, and write it down for just the next month. And then also, Every time you exert yourself, have sex, mow the lawn, shovel snow, exercise, carry the laundry upstairs, whatever it is that works up a sweat, slap that blood pressure cuff on while you're doing it and check your blood pressure. That's when it's highest. Write those down. Then show them to your doctor. And he or she may say, oh, your blood pressure is kind of high at night. Let's adjust your medicines. Or why is it high on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday? Oh, I exercise on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So let's take some different blood pressure medicines on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. If you don't modify those risk factors, at least control things like smoking. At the end of the day, the takeaway message is that stroke, being paralyzed, being unable to speak, is worse than death for many people. Everyone needs to know that we can identify these risk factors, treat them, we can screen for many reasons for stroke, whether it's the atrial fibrillation with your eye watch or a Doppler, do the tests, and fix it before you have a stroke. Yeah. You can't do that with car accidents, right, on I-65 and 894. Nope. You can't predict them, but we can predict these. We can predict who's at risk for a stroke. We can alter their lifestyle. It changes your family's lifestyle, of course, because we can prevent them. And that's all because we have very simple tests. I implore everyone listening to this podcast, hope that everyone goes out and limits those risk factors, changes them, alters them, and go to see their doctor to check this out and make sure they don't have a stroke in the future. Well, I love having experts on, especially when they're good guests like you and they know how to do these things and get the words out right in a timely fashion. So, Dr. Great to speak with you again. You stay well. Thanks, Scott. And go to franciscanhealth.org slash heart for more insight on your risk of heart disease and stroke and take our free health risk assessment. And if you found this podcast helpful, please share it on your social channels and be sure to check out the full podcast library for additional topics of interest. This is the Franciscan Health Doc Pod. I'm Scott Webb. Stay well, and we'll talk again next time.